We are so thrilled that everyone can join us today for this insightful and timely conversation. This panel explores the life and legacy of Joseph Warren, who attended to the victims of the Boston massacre, which occurred just outside the old state house. Warren played an inspirational role within his community as a celebrated doctor, a revolutionary political figure, and a brilliant orator. His life highlights for us the unique role that medical practitioners play within the communities that they serve. We're truly grateful to the panelists who can join us today who carry on Warren's work, either through their own medical practices or through their research into his life. With that, I'd like to introduce our guests, dynamic thinkers and widely recognized experts in the field whom we're very lucky to have with us today. Christian Despina is the author of Founding Martyr, The Life and Death of Dr. Joseph Warren, The American Revolution's Lost Hero. He's the executive director of the Joseph Warren Foundation and also serves on the board of the Bunker Hill Memorial Association. Dr. Catherine Gergen Barnett is the vice chair of primary care innovation and transformation in the Department of Family Medicine at the Boston Medical Center. She's also a clinical associate professor at the Boston University School of Medicine and a fellow at BU's Institute for Health System Innovation and Policy. She's become an active public voice on TV and radio, as well as a regular contributor to the Boston Globe opinion page. Finally, she's actively involved in local and state health policy relating to addressing health inequities. And also joining us this evening is Scott Podolsky, a primary care physician at Massachusetts General Hospital, professor of global health and social medicine at Harvard Medical School, and also director of the Center for the History of Medicine at the Coutway Medical Library. Um, so Christian, I was hoping you could kick off the conversation today by giving us a brief background on who Joseph Warren was um, and what likely drew him to medicine in the context of his time and place. Yeah, so Joseph Warren is born in 1741 in Roxbury, Massachusetts to a humble farming family. He's uh, lucky enough to be able to get into Harvard and he does his undergraduate degree there. When he graduates, he becomes uh, alma he becomes a teacher at his old alma mater in Roxbury Latin, then decides to get his medical degree. And I think that's one of the things that have always uh, intrigued historians as to why he would have become a physician. I think there's a number of reasons. Um, one of them first and foremost, foremost was the death of his father in his freshman year in Harvard. He uh, dies from a ladder while he's picking these Warren russet apples from the trees. And Warren would have been there when it happened and his father died immediately. And his mother is the one who urges him to go back to school and get his education. And really, when he goes back to Harvard, it really becomes a social oasis for him. This is where he's meeting some of the most highest ranking students who are the sons of British officials. And these will have consequences for him later on. And it really is an incredible story because the question is, how does the son of a humble Roxbury farmer rise to become one of the chief political activists in the Massachusetts Bay Colony and one of the top military leaders, uh, you know, in the highest social strata of, a, of a, an environment that's highly puritanical at this time where older people are deferring to him and placing themselves in his care. So it really is an incredible story on a lot of different levels. Great. Um, and so uh, I see Scott's computer appears to have crashed. So he's um, on his way back to join us. So um, Catherine, could you speak a little bit about your own work and what led you to pursue medicine as a vocation? Absolutely. I, I just so appreciate learning more and more uh, about Dr. Warren and, and his path and, you know, just thinking about how now our work goes back to recruiting uh, folks who live in places like Roxbury and, and Dorchester and, and how do we get them into medicine. So may that part of the legacy continue. Um, and also feeling really kind of uh, some symbiosis uh, in terms of, you know, I actually, when I was um, uh, kind of going through my, my undergrad training, I was always interested in the intersection of medicine and public health and actually public policy. Uh, but the folks that I met, uh, for anybody who's interested in pre-med, um, along the way in, in pre-medicine was they were just not my people. I was really interested, again, in terms of how do we impact and work with communities. And, and I didn't see that actually until years later, I was working um, 
in the HIV community uh, in San Francisco right in 1996, where uh, if, if folks remember, that's when we just started having medications coming out, our first antiretroviral therapies, which feels very, again, very applicable to where we are right now with COVID-19 as we're uh, running Paxlovid trials and, and all of that um, in our hospital. And it was only in those um, days and months um, that I had the opportunity and really privilege to bear witness to physicians who were, um, you know, walking shoulder to shoulder with patients, thinking about how do we advocate, how do we build trust, how do you, especially for people who had um, lost trust in medicine, um, right, because of all the ways they've been stigmatized. Um, through HIV and, and through their life, um, you know, living sort of on the margins, quote unquote, of, of what was considered mainstream. Um, and those were real heroes for me. And I know even just earlier, we were talking about Dr. Paul Farmer and um, people who really walked uh, in those kinds of steps. And, and, and I went into medicine um, thinking about the possibility of being in people's lives like that and recognizing that medicine, and I know we'll explore this more, but it's much more than um, learning about blood pressure and, um, you know, surgical technique. Uh, and that was really inspiring to me. Totally. Um, so Catherine, I feel like you were already beginning to touch on this um, in your answer, but I think it's a, a framing question for us tonight. Um, public health definitely has meant different things in different times and different places. So I want to talk a little bit about how you and Scott, hopefully he'll be able to come back on soon, um, think about drawing the boundaries of public health in a 21st century context, and then kind of ask Christian to weigh in on how folks might have interpreted or thought, interpreted or thought about public health in the 18th century. So wonderful. Yeah. Well, um, from the landscape where we are now, if, if we haven't been thinking about public health and the gaps in public health, um, it's hard to imagine where, where you've been, right? Because we know that the entire um, pandemic has been shaped by where we are in the United States in terms of our public health infrastructure. Um, and uh, you know, I will I will just say that historically, and even uh, up to the year prior to the pandemic beginning, there were massive cuts on public health infrastructure. CDC received, I think, a twelve percent uh, budget cut, and globally there was twenty five percent kind of cut on all kind of global health programs. And yet, what we know is that a very small portion, up to just 20% of somebody's health is actually dictated by what happens inside of the clinical visit, mm -hmm. inside of the hospital, um, inside of kind of traditional medicine and all of the other pieces, you know, 20% is genetics, but the large lion's share is shaped by where you live, access to um, clean air that we think about a lot now, uh, clean water, food, et cetera. And all of those infrastructures are supported by public health. Um, and yet the infrastructure that we have now, I think we've, we've discovered, I think probably the majority of us um, who haven't been in public health or thinking about this have discovered in the hard way that there's an enormous amount of fracture um, that has happened in our country between public health and private mm -hmm. sector and how does that coordinate with the federal government and how much is left to the state government. And, um, and, and that is, I think, really kind of shown our fragility um, mm -hmm. when fundamentally you really cannot move the health of a people forward without a robust public health program. Yep. So Christian, how, how would Warren have thought about public health? What, what was the 18th century equivalent of how do we bring all those factors together to ensure that the community is healthy and functioning? Yeah, I mean, we don't have much in the way of written records about his thought on maybe public policy. So I would go off his actions and a prime example are these smallpox outbreaks. And in 1764, there's a really, really horrific one. And it's particularly virulent because 10 out of the first 12 people die. And similar to today's COVID-19 pandemic, you know, you had people who were against inoculation, people who were pro-inoculation. This is a time when people still believe in sort of sorcery and this might be God's divine intervention, but 
the incredible thing is that, you know, if you really think about the heroes at the colonies during this time, it's not generally, you know, there's no rock stars or movie movie action stars. It's It really becomes these doctors who, who go on the front lines during this pandemic. And again, it's not a time when inoculation is universally acceptable, but they set up shop in Castle William and, and a lot of this, the expenses are, are covered by them. So if there's a patient who can't afford to get the inoculation, they're providing it gratis. Mm -hmm. And the incredible thing about Warren is that he inoculates over 100 patients in 1764, not one of them die under his watch. And keep in wow. mind, a couple of decades earlier, when Cotton Mather and Dr. Zabdiel Boylston are encouraging these smallpox inoculations, someone throws a firebomb through Cotton Mather's window. Wow. And it doesn't detonate, but it says a pox upon you. I hope there's a pox upon you in your house. So again, this is not really a popular uh, practice at this point, and even in 1764. But once the smallpox epidemic subsides, Warren and these doctors immediately are kind of catapulted to this hero status, right? They've they've saved the town mm -hmm. from, from this vision. And think about it, right? Smallpox was not far from the front and center in the mind of all the colonials. George Washington mm -hmm. contracts it in Barbados. So, so this was, and mortality rates could get as high as 33%. I mean, it always amazes me how history really does repeat itself, because if you look at 2020, there's so many similarities to Boston in yeah. 1764. So it's just, it really is. I mean, there are so many incredible parallels. It's, it really is such a fascinating episode then. And now we're seeing this sort of unfold again. So I think, you know, Christian, your last comment sort of speaks to this. Um, I'd love to hear from all the panelists. What do you feel like being a doctor does for one? Do you, does it give you a special purchase or understanding on the social and political challenges that face a nation? Um, and if so, how? So I'll, I'll respond to that um, now. And I and will also just um, say that I, I saw a comment in the chat about public health being very disposable. And I couldn't agree with that more in terms of where we are right now with the landscape. Um, so, so I, I, I just, I, every day I take it as a deep privilege, uh, to, uh, get to serve, you know, in, in, in the place in somebody's life, um, as a primary care physician, as a family physician, taking care of generations of people at Boston Medical Center, where, um, for those of, uh, us who are, are familiar with Boston is, is the largest safety net hospital in all of New England. And, um, people's lives are rich with kind of narrative of um, all the different strands of what we're seeing kind of um, locally and nationally. And um, all one has to do is really listen to the stories um, because in those stories, you're not only hearing about um, what's happening inside of a person's body, but also where those illnesses are coming from, right? So we have to understand, I mean, Finally, I think medicine is catching up to this idea, which actually intersects with what we were just talking about in terms of public health, that um, all of the milieu, the stress, your race, you know, your, your class, all of those things obviously um, impact one's health. Um, and, and the health of uh, prior generations impact your health as well through all sorts of microaggressions and uh, microgenetics and, and things that we are still trying to understand. Um, and so again, just by, um, for instance, thinking about like the child tax credit and thinking about the ways in which that impacted um, positively uh, my families. And now, you know, that that's being rescinded and, and, um, uh, and I'm not gonna get into politics, I'm not here to talk about politics, but, you know, uh, and I always have to say that on public radio, I'm not, it's really just thinking about the health implications, right? And, um, and so, I think that every single person's life has, it's like a macrocosm for what's happening, um, you know, uh, in, in the political and policy landscape. I think the, the challenge, well, there's lots of challenge in current day medicine. Um, and just to highlight a few is A, we just don't have time to listen to those stories. Mm -hmm. B, people often aren't given the lens to listen to those stories in that way, right? Because so much of it is um, a, uh, a sort of um, find and fix uh, phenomenon rather than just kind yeah. of noticing and trying to step back and see the bigger picture. And then, and, and hopefully, and I know we'll talk about this, hopefully then advocate for that bigger picture. Um, but I, but I will say that, um, I am, I am 
always, um, I always feel like my patients are my teachers, um, and and they will they will forever be teaching me about um, what I don't see, right? Because I have um, my lived experience is really different uh, for many of my patients in the day to day way. Yeah. When you think about, I just want to follow up on that question. When you think about sort of the lessons that you've learned from your patients, you know, could you tell us a couple stories or some of the the things that as a doctor, when you got to know your patients and you uncovered something, you were like, oh, this is really transforming how I'm understanding the world around me. Yeah. Oh gosh. So many. And, and, (laughs) you know, and, and again, I think that I've had the opportunity to bring some of this into my writing for my, Mm -hmm. my Boston globe opinion pieces, um, which I, um, I feel so happy that people want to hear the stories, right? Uh, but I, for for an example, right? So I have a large, um, uh, not large, but comparatively large portion of patients who have served some sort of time in incarceration um, or have been directly impacted by loved ones who have been incarcerated. And, um, you know, there are so many pieces that I have known to be gaps in terms of care for when somebody is coming yeah. out of incarceration, um, what kinds of medical care are they get in, mm-hmm. kind of gaps exist. But it was um, really through talking to patients that I started to understand all of the ways that people um, are incredibly socially isolated from one another. Um, There's Mm -hmm. actually um, kind of ways in which they're prevented from seeing anybody who has any other kind of criminal record. And if they see them, then it actually is a violation of their probation. So in, in, in Boston, actually speaking of history of Boston, Um, Boston was one of the first places to have a probation. It was supposed to really be so that people can sort of be expedited towards normalcy um, post-incarceration. Again, I'm not claiming to be an expert on this, but there are really um, kind of archaic and arcane rules that are still in our, you know, legislation that say that it is then, you know, we are, we are um, one of the only places that are um, saying you can, you cannot fraternize uh, with anybody with a, with any other kind of incarceration history. And you can imagine that does a whole nother set of redlining, right, in different neighborhoods, um, where there's enormous percentage of people who have any sort of history of criminal record for, for all kinds of systemic racism, things that we could unpack. Pack. Um, and, and so w- their rates of being, you know, then actually reincarcerated go up, right? So it's a yeah. negative. So that's just one small micro one small example, um, but something that I would not know just by reading, you know, public health journals or JAMA or, you know, yeah. <laughs> Or, you know, it's just, it's, those are the things that are kind of illustrated. And that's where we need to be using our advocacy voices and saying, I'm not sure that other people know this. And I, and I have a um, bird's eye view on the front lines. Um, and, and so it's my duty to report it. Yeah. Um, Scott, welcome back from your technical challenges. It's lovely to. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Joseph Ward did I have to deal with those. Although I think he would have been far more innovative in getting back on. So I apologize. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to play just a little bit of catch up um, and then pop us back to the piece of the conversation we were in. So um, I did want to ask you, we, we spoke at the beginning about sort of why Warren might have gotten into medicine. And so one of my questions for opening for everybody was sort of what drew you into medicine um, and just tell us a little bit about your own work. So can you please do that as sure. <laughs> so we enter the conversation? It clearly wasn't because I was adept at problem solving on my feet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for, for me, really, um, I, I, mean, I certainly had one you know, conventional narrative. I, I really did want to help individual people one on one. It's my love of primary care. But I was also I was a history of science undergraduate, um, and I've really since since the beginning tried to, to merge the two. And, and certainly, I love bringing these notions of history and context and the forces shaping the lives of my patients and our interactions um, into the clinic. And um, you know, then getting to bring uh, my experience with my patients back into the archives and it and, and, and shapes what, what, what I'm interested in. Um, and of course, you know, for the last 15 years, I've been in a department that recently was chaired by the late Paul Farmer, who really taught us all that, that, that everything we saw, uh, this inter- you know, the, the biological didn't exist apart from the social. And he would always go, everything's in context and, and history. And he was an yeah. enormous advocate for history himself. Yeah, Scott and Catherine, um, 
so I'm kind of just in case some folks here are not as familiar with uh, Paul Farmer, can you just tell a little bit, give, give a little bit of a bio on him? Because he, he actually is a little bit like our Joseph Warren of the, <laughs> of the 21st century um, in some ways. So that would be helpful. Sure. Okay, Catherine, I'm happy to turn over to you first. No, I, I was just about to say the same thing. I sure. would, I, yeah. I mean, Paul is this, Paul is this you know, remarkable, remarkable human being who uh, was an undergraduate in anthropology at, at Duke and then went to, to Haiti before coming to here at Harvard Medical School and was, was absolutely inspired to, to help the, those um, most in need um, and has and had been for the ensuing four plus decades um, for, forming clinics in, in Haiti, Rwanda, Peru. He becomes a founder of Partners in Health, but he was also just brilliant. He was a brilliant anthropologist, funny, so smart, so inspiring. Um, and he was my academic department chair here at, at our medical school. He was an anthropologist, physician, um, trained, trained at the Brigham. Um, really um, in, you know, inspired um, to uh, give options to those who are most, most vulnerable to reduce what he thought uh, called structural violence, things that, like poverty and racism and, and gender violence that inhibit individual agency and really did everything he could both upstream and downstream to, to help empower patients. Um, and he, he, he died in his sleep about two weeks ago at the, at the age of 62. Um, so we had a great, um couple questions come through that in a way I think Catherine touch on your point about the, the nature of a practice and how that can really shape your understanding of the world. Um, so one of the interesting things about Warren is that his own practice, um, and Christian can probably speak more to this and better than I can, really included both members of the Patriot community and the Tory community, um, as well as other folks. So one of the questions from the chat is how, how was Warren able to hold that kind of a practice together, um, which and I guess my question to Catherine and Scott would be, is that common in today's day and age that you can get um, that much crossover and diversity? But uh, Christian, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about Warren's practice. Well, I think that's one of the incredible things. And I think it was in 1769, Dr. Thomas Young, who's another Boston physician, uh, refers to Warren's practice as now first in business in this town. But you know, Warren really does have a foot on each side of the political divide. You see his early medical ledgers. He's documenting treatment to the, you know, the big names, right? The Hutchinsons, the Hallowells, the Olivers, all these royal officials. But he's also treating uh, ship captains, merchants, lemon sellers, bakers, slaves, uh, jail people. So, I mean, he really has a foot on every rung of this social ladder, and he's sort of straddling this political divide. And I think that's the amazing thing that both sides were trying to veer him in their direction. So we know that Warren knew Thomas Hutchinson very well. He helped settle the probate estate of his father's will. He actually, he's appointed as the almshouse physician to Boston, which is an extremely lucrative position. I believe he earns over a thousand pounds over a two, three year period. Uh, he's appointed, appointed as administrator to the Nathaniel Wheelwright estate, another lucrative position he had no business getting, but so he's getting all this financial patronage and just when you're doing the research, you're thinking, why would someone cast their lot with the wigs? Because it's really tantamount to financial suicide. But the thing <laughs> is, as you read Warren's ledgers, as they go year through year, you see the balance start to level off between, you know, members of the court party, members of the Patriot Party, and then it starts to really veer off into really only Patriots and Whigs. And he loses a lot of financial patronage, but you really see for a time both parties courting him to their side. And, you know, I always kind of bring this up, that show Little House on the Prairie, remember the doctor? And he, people are coming and saying, Doc, can you help me? And they're paying him with chickens. And what's amazing is when you read Warren's medical ledgers, he's canceling a lot of fees out saying, you know, in consideration of this gentleman's misfortune. So this is really how Warren does rise to social prominence, right? Because he's, think about it, there's no medical school, there's no hospitals. So these doctors stand as that one institution. And when they're coming into people's homes, they're there for the, the most intimate moments of their lives, right? The birth of a child, the death of a loved one, and he's helping save patients and heal them. And that's why it's sort of ironic that we remember him as this fighting military general when for his entire adult life, he's, he's, he's saving patients, healing them. And you see throughout the ledgers, accepting beer, flour, shoes in the form of payment. So he's wow. really gaining this reputation of generosity and people come to place themselves under his, not only his, his medical care, but also putting their confidence in his political opinions. 
great. Um, it's so, so fascinating. Um, so um, just kind of circling back, because I think Scott wouldn't have a chance to ask you this question directly. Um, it touches on this. What do you feel are the ways in which being a doctor gives one a special purchase or understanding of the social and political problems facing a nation or a community? Yeah, and, and it's important that physicians, especially over, over the 20th century, but we can see it's so you know, the 18th century have acquired this, this, this cultural authority, right? I mean, and, and that, that's not inevitable, but that was certainly a historical process. And then so you had, let's say in the 20th century, physicians um, like, like Bernie Lown, who also died in the past year, uh, who was one of the co-founders of International Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War, that you think of medicalization sometimes, when we think of like pharmaceuticals as the sort of the thing that shouldn't happen, but really you can medicalize um, political issues and, and, have, and lend that cultural authority. So physicians, for instance, medicalized nuclear war to say, this is, this is not something we can plan for. This is just a horrific event and they led to disarmament. Uh, we see physicians in more recent decades trying to politicize climate change. And we'll see if they're mm -hmm. as successful as they were with places like IPD and W. So they're really, I mean, there is this leveraging of, of hard earned cultural authority sometimes for what could be considered political issues um, and, and rendering them to medical health issues. Great, okay. Um, fantastic. So um, I guess this is kind of leading us to another question, which is, um, what are the moments at which we need doctors to raise their political voices? What are, what are those moments? And when you think from a historical perspective, um, where do you feel like it's that doctor's advocacy work has been transformational or revolutionary? And where do you think maybe there's some lessons learned on how not to do it? Are there ways in which it's backfired? So I know who wants to take that one for starters. Um, I, I can start. And, and I also just wanted to respond um, uh, a little bit to Christian's point about Warren, right? About sort of this idea of like, how do we straddle, um, you know, both parties? And, and, and I think you answered it so beautifully by saying, you know, fundamentally at the end of the day, it's about that intimacy of kind of the I and thou, right? And sort of how are you getting to be um, uh, taking care of the human, right? And, and people not bringing their politics. But I will also say that it was remarkable that you talked about what started to happen, um, you know, as he became more politicized and also noting where we are now, right, in terms of, and this is connected and to your question of how um, I think that unfortunately, because uh, so much has been so politicized in the course of the last two years that having any sort of political kind of connection inherently can create division. So I think our job is to, you know, obviously come back to that human connection and recognize that that's the most powerful thing and go from there. Um, but I, to that point, I think that as we think about raising our voice, advocating, being, you know, political with a lowercase p, um, I think about all of the different examples that have happened over the last two years, and even just thinking about how we started to do vaccine rollouts, right, in communities, and and um, having this sort of idea that we should go to the mega sites, we should go to you know these large stadiums, and that's where we're going to vaccinate everybody, and 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 folks like myself and other you know primary care physicians and lots of community health centers. Um, doing really good work said, you know, actually that really doesn't work. Like that doesn't work for our patients. That doesn't work for the way that we've done care for decades, right? Which is about that individual relationship, taking care of people in their community. Um, give us the vaccines, right? Let us do it. Let us kind of, even if it's inconvenient, even if you have to have these super freezer, you know, crazy things and aliquots that are, you know, unreasonable, let us do it. Um, and so I think those are examples of where um, that kind of raising of voice in um, effort to get better public health for a large number of people has been critical. Um, and that's just one small micro example of, of, you know, many, many things that have happened over the course of um, the last 
you know, a few hundred years since Warren was doing his work. That being said, and I'll, I'll just leave it at this for now, um, I think there's also cautionary tales. And I think that we've also seen um, people, uh, you know, I would say abusing their medical license by spreading misinformation is, you know, one way of saying it, of saying things that um, haven't been scientifically proven um, and, and um, using it for political divisiveness. Uh, and so I think, you know, it's, it can go, it can cut both ways. So I think that idea, and Scott, you raised it, you know, I think it's a, being a physician has sort of this moral kind of code and conduct. And I think that the question is, is how do we use that politically in a way that cuts the right, the right way? Yeah. One of the questions that just popped up on the chat is what about the argument that doctors are straying into cultural and political issues for which they have no expertise? So I don't know. If yeah, I mean, and I'll just respond to that by saying one thing, and then I'll be very curious, Scott, to hear your perspective <laughs> as well as Christian. Um, I have actually, like I shared, I've actually come to really um, try to be very clear, you know, because I think before I just assumed that people understood this, but I think you can never assume anything nowadays that when you're speaking about something medical or you're giving the data, you're very clear that you're not being political because I actually think, again, so much has become, so much kind of science has become political, political has become science. And so um, how do we kind of disaggregate that? And also, how do you claim that expertise when you really are an expert um, and not have to, you know, there are many people who are experts at both. Um, and that's okay. And that's more than okay. It's, it's a beautiful thing, but making sure that people are clear about what their expertise are. I mean, sometimes, I mean, much of medicine is about mobilizing data. Uh, and, and, and so for instance, I mean, one place where the medical community at one point was told to stay in its lane was around gun violence, as though that was a quote unquote, a non-medical issue. And one can roll out the data showing mm -hmm. the number of gun deaths and how that correlates with gun laws and things like that. And I mean, you, you're, you're right. You can't just say, okay, I'm a physician, therefore I can pontificate about anything. But if one does, does translate this into a public health or individual medical concern and reports that data, well then that, that, that becomes our lane. Um, so so <laughs> it's, it's only gun violence is, I mean, as a case in point. That's an interesting example. Yeah, it. Um, I wanna circle back to one of the other um, questions that was raised here, because I think it touches on this question of politiz politicization and how patients and doctors interrelate with each other. Um, so one of the questions was, does, did Warren have issues with preserving lives as a doctor and fighting and taking lives as a patriot? How did he resolve that contradiction? Yeah, I guess um, the, the, the tussle for that is, you know, really Warren's military career is such a blip on the radar. But unfortunately, that's how he's remembered today, right? When people recognize his, his name, if, if at all, it's, oh, he's the guy who gets killed at Bunker Hill, or he's the guy who sends Paul Revere on his midnight ride. And, you know, I think there's a, a tale to be learned here because Warren's uh, medical mentor was Dr. James Lloyd, right? He's a staunch loyalist, and he remains a staunch loyalist throughout his medical career. And, and Warren maintains this close relationship with him. And, and it's my argument that that was Warren's first mentor because his father dies at an early age. And then it's Dr. James Lloyd who is bringing back these, these most up-to-date medical techniques that he's learning over in the glittering capitals of Europe, you know, smallpox inoculations, obstetrical care, when this is a society really that's been used to having midwives deliver children. So, you know, Warren is straddling into these worlds and, you know, there's this really nasty incident between him and a Dr. Thomas Young, where they're actually getting into a public fight talking about he was a little too liberal in bloodletting a patient. But, you know, in the end, they kind of come together and form this great friendship. So I, I think there is something to be learned from that then that here are guys who are friends, doctors, you know, who are on both sides of this political divide, but they're mm -hmm. still friends. And, and really, Dr. James Lloyd has never harassed once the, you know, during the siege of Boston or after, you know, a lot of loyalists get their homes taken and possessions seized. You know, Lloyd is left sort of unmolested. So there are some lessons to be learned from back then or, or tales of inspiration where these doctors can see things politically you know, differently or not agree, but yet they still come together for the benefit of the community. Yeah. Christian, was there any um, 
pressure that you think Warren got that it was inappropriate for him as a doctor to be engaged in political matters, or was that not something that was controversial at the time? Yeah, I think I, I, I think everyone sort of did it. I remember the first instance is during the um, the Pope's Day rioting, and a and a young boy is killed during the 1764 rioting, and Warren sort of writes a medical letter on behalf of one of the rioters, and he sort of excused and and sort of pardoned. And and this is really the first time you see Warren the doctor start to cross sec with Warren the politician. So again, you know, I I don't think it might have been as I hate to say taboo, but I think physicians were able to get away with it a little bit better back then, maybe as now. And I'm not saying that there weren't polarizing effects as far as politics, social medicine or anything with that. But I think Warren does such a good job of straddling that fence that he really does keep a lot of his loyalist connections. And he's, you know, eventually he becomes sort of this big thorn in the side of, of the British, but he's He's a gentleman scholar, right? He's a Harvard physician. He he's learned how to master the nuances of a bedside manner through Lloyd. You know, Lloyd is friends with men like General William Howe, Lord Hugh Percy. And so when Warren is living with him during his apprenticeship, he's learning how to become a gentleman, right? How to dress, how to entertain, hmm. how, to, how to become a doctor, all these techniques. And so again, you see this sort of straddling of both sides of the argument. So it's, it's just an amazing thing that he was able to do that for as long as he did. And really he becomes a figure that both sides are looking to, to try and maybe lay a little groundwork for an olive branch or a peaceful solution for so many of these explosive incidents. Great. Um, we just got another interesting uh, question from the chat that I wanted to see what you all thought about. Warren seems to have been able to forge informed relationships with patients. To what extent do you think the contemporary health system is designed with the intent of improving care ultimately undermine the ability to treat patients as whole people? Seeing some smiles there. <laughs> uh, I'll jump in first and, and, and very curious too. I'm, smi I'm only smiling because I, I ask this question to myself every day um, and, and it's a really important question. Uh, well, you know, and, and, and probably worthy of a much longer conversation, but I will just say, um, you know, first of all, um, I deeply, you know, with deep honor and respect to so many, um, physicians who are out there who are specialists and doing amazing work. I think the way that we have set up healthcare so that people are specialized to take care of one very small portion of a human being, um, inherently right makes them a less whole person um with with the best of intentions even um then you know your you know in family medicine we get to take care of again the whole family multiple generations but oftentimes medicine is really seeing the individuals right so you don't understand them in the context of their 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 family or or their community um you know people are seen often outside of their community so community health centers is an amazing um um, kind of opportunity to be in your, where you live and where you're born oftentimes, but academic medical centers are often far away from where people live and are, you know, again, um, take away from the wholeness. And then, you know, most kind of perhaps most detrimental to uh, the system is the system that we've set up in terms of how we're reimbursing physicians, right? So, um, you know, this whole, whole idea of fee for service that you um, continue to see people for um, uh, perhaps things that are um, not contributing to their overall wellness um, and um, not necessarily seeing others who maybe can't access care or are worried about coming in and then they don't they sort of get left to the fringes so hopefully speaking of revolutions uh we are sort of you know um i'm always the optimist but very much in the revolution of doing value-based care so we're really reaching out to people and thinking about um how do we actually shift the way that we take care of folks so that we're paid to keep them healthy rather than to keep them ill and seeing us all the time. Um, so, so that is a, a very simplistic kind of answer to that. But I, I think it's a really important question to be continuing to ask and not just take it for granted what we do. Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely agree. And it is, I mean, we could spend hours on this. I mean, there's a, there's a recent 
great graphic medicine um, article in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's sort of a cartoon version of comparing this doctor who knew all of his patients uh, compared with, with modern systems where people plug in for a while and then plug out and may not put the patients in. The truth is it's, a, it's, a, it's an enduring trope. I mean, you can find there's a wonderful Alfred Worcester article in the then Boston Medical and Surgical Journal from 1912. It's the same thing. Saying, look at the doc of the 1870s. He knew all the patients. <laughs> and, you know, these newfangled guys who are, may, may know the, the, the various techniques, but they don't know about the patients per se. So on the one hand, it is an enduring trope. On the other hand, there are so many new forces that, that are shifting this even more with some with electronic medical record. And I come into my office and my computer says, have you asked your patient about their Tdap, which is for like diphtheria, which Joseph Warren saw a lot more diphtheria than I have. I, I mean, it's, <laughs> Um, you know, and, and, and there's some opportunity costs at the time you can sit down with your patient and truly find out what is important to, to, to them. Um, and so it, so it, it is, I mean, there, there are these system level um, aspects of or asking someone to look at the computer while your patient is 90 degrees from one. Um, and it, it's really, I mean, I think we really still have to center our patients right in front of us um, and think about what's important to them. Absolutely. Here's a question from the chat. Uh, do we know what was Warren's uh, or current to his times attitudes towards abortion and euthanasia? We don't. Again, the uh, the, the 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 trail of writings is, is is sort of scant, and and from what we do know, Warren did not leave any of his thoughts about anything about abort abortion or or euthanasia. We don't have any accounts in his medical records of him performing any kind of uh, abortion or or any kind of euthanistic uh, ending of a life or anything like that. So I would I would not be able to answer okay. that because there's just nothing that exists on that. But it's still a good question. Yeah, I thought it was. It was interesting to see. Um, okay, um, so I just wanted to kind of circle back around again to the question of when should doctors be raising their political voices? Um, so I'm interested in hearing um, a little bit about when do you feel like um, doctors raising their political voices has been unhelpful out in the world? Or if you, maybe the, the question is this, if you were trying to give guidance to, to a young physician <laughs> about what not to do, um, what might you, what might your advice be? I will say, I mean, I'm happy to run with this for a little bit, <laughs> but I mean, there is this, there is this likewise long tradition of um, physicians advocating for the, the, the role of, um, the role as uh, attorneys for the poor, so to speak, right? So, so there's this lineage of what we call social medicine, right? And some folks will date this back to Rudolf Ierkow in, in Germany in the 1840s, who said that physicians are the natural attorneys for the poor. He said medicine is a social science and you know, really, really saw this as, as, a, as a important thing. And he ends up trying to duel with Bismarck in Germany and we still have reform in Germany. Um, and, and certainly we see generations of physician activists today echoing back to um, um, uh, Ierkow. And some of Ierkow's Disciples go on and teach folks like like Che Guevara and and, and and I mean so and there's a whole Latin American social medicine component that that's explicitly political. Um, we think about when it can go bad. I mean again, it depends on where you know it's somewhat in the eyes of the beholder, right? So to me, I mean certainly Morris Fishbein was the head of the Journal of the American Medical Association in the 30s and 40s, was, was the leading. Um, I mean, he's the one who really demonized social uh, socialized medicine, not just social medicine, but this mm -hmm. notion of universal healthcare. Uh, as, as sort of equivalent to Bolshevism or communism. Uh, and to weigh that, I mean, that lineage we still see 80 years later. I and mean, that derived from medicine into society. I don't think vice versa. Um, so from my end, that was a damaging proposal if we, if we, if we believe in equity and we believe in um, the, the healthcare as, as a right, not a commodity. So again, it depends on one's perspective, but one could, you know, once you do accrue that authority, you can deploy it in various ways. Yeah. Yeah, I, I uh, kind of reflected upon this um, before, but I it, I wanted to tie it back to a question that I saw in the chat around, like how much public health teaching do we get in medical school? And then the same would be asked of, you know, how much kind of advocacy and 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 po political kind of uh, ways of raising voices do you get taught in medical school? I I, I will say I um I went to Yale, so I can't, you know, I don't know what what how Harvard has done it, but um. It is. Um, it's. It's not in the agenda, and and I think it's changed hmm. since 
I think actually um, now that we're actually teaching about social determinants of health and we're, you know, much more kind of um, the, the academic literature has caught up to it, right? And there was even just a, a great piece in, in health affairs, which I think is really one of the number one kind of um, health policy journals that had a whole series on racism as a social determinant of health. And, and that discourse is becoming very mainstream now or more mainstream, but for, 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 you know, so that's, but that's very recent. Um, and I think, you know, Scott, to your point, I think there, there's a lost art um, that hopefully, you know, one of the silver linings of, of the pandemic is that will be kind of fomented um, again, and uh, people will sort of take up that, that piece of medicine and recognize that it's an inherent part of um, the work that we do um, for many people. Sorry, sorry. I was just gonna say, you know, it's interesting that, that kind of you talk about these sort of these waves that, that come and go. And I'm like, a student just finished, my undergraduate student just finished her thesis yesterday. Uh, and I was looking at this period in the late 60s, early 70s, at the end of the civil rights movement. And, and Catherine mentioned the advent of community health centers in the mid 60s. This is when, for instance, Harvard initiated affirmative action here at the medical school, was really kind of, you know, had its quote committee, a commission on the relations uh, with the black community, which was really HMS situated here in, in, in Roxbury attempting to engage with these communities and figure out these social determinants of health. And that was a fruitful period. And then it sort of dissipated. And, and that's not to say it died away entirely, but certainly even when I was a medical student, there was not prominent the way it was then. And certainly in the last several years, the murder of George Floyd and, and COVID and its revelation of disparities, we're seeing it again. And the hope is that this won't be just another you know, wave that then goes away. This will be a, a more permanent uh, movement. Yeah. Um, sorry, one person with a factual question that I def definitely want to get answered. Um, so what happened to Dr. Warren's practice as the events came to a head by 1775? Is it, can you be a, a busy doctor and revolutionary at the same time, or does one of them have to give? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'll give an example. When Warren delivers his second Boston masqueration on March 6, 1775, there's rumors floating around Boston that British soldiers are going to assassinate anyone who delivers that oration and Warren volunteers. And before he goes to Old South, he treats five patients that day. So, I mean, it, it really is like he, he's kind of really doing it all. And um, I, is the, the question they ask, what happens to the medical practice? Yeah, what happens I mean, to the medical yeah, practice? So when he hears eight militiamen have been killed on Lexington Green, he doesn't just decide, well, let me sit behind my desk and start writing letters to the other and continental <laughs> congress right he he goes into the fighting right he crosses the charles and he goes to arlington which is uh you know monotony and there he's almost killed when a british musket ball knocks out uh the pin in his uh wig and so i mean you know it's amazing because he goes there and not only is he fighting but he's helping to treat the wounded and now thus begins the siege of boston so he can never get back to his medical practice so and that's another thing. He's got five medical apprentices who all be go, go on to become staunch patriots. Uh, one, William Eustace, goes on to become a future governor of Massachusetts. But really, the medical practice is dismantled because, you know, as we know, Warren's killed two months after the Battle of Lexington and Concord. And so really, uh, after the siege of Boston, I, it's really his brother, John Warren, who carries on this medical legacy, right? Because John Warren was an apprentice of his brother, Dr. Joseph Warren. So you know, again, the medical practice sort of splinters and, you know, obviously Warren's killed and, and, and John Warren is the one who carries the torch for what is going to become a medical dynasty of Warren's. I believe it's eight generations of yeah. Harvard doctors, if I'm not mistaken, right? And yeah. his nephew, Dr. John Collins Warren, the Ether Dome Project, right? He's the first physician to operate successfully with anesthesia. His, his son performs the first rhinoplasty. So we're not just talking, you know, doctors. I mean, these are incredible doctors. And even there's um, Warren's own direct descendants through him, uh, Dr. Carolyn Matthews, who's the trustee of the Copley Painting and Museum of Fine Arts is an um, gynecological uh, oncologist at the University of Baylor. So again, it's this incredible medical dynasty. We, we know medicine was rudimentary at that time, but maybe perhaps I've often wondered Warren's real... Uh, contribution is perhaps in his legacy and through all the medical apprentices that he's training. Wow, that's fascinating, Christian. Yeah, his, his, his nephew not only right, does the first surgery under public surgery under, under anesthesia, he founds the New England Journal of Medicine. He's the co-founder of Massachusetts General Hospital. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
So I think this um, raises an opportunity to touch on another question, um, which is another audience member asked, should there be more doctors in Congress, state, state legislatures, and local governments? Um, thoughts? Yes. <laughs> 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 what's, what's standing in the way <laughs> oh my gosh so many things I mean, uh I bet, well, actually and also why what? yeah okay so so i i'll just i'll give my two cents and of course you know really would love to hear from my my colleagues and and also you know anybody else who wants to chat in but um you know, for all of the reasons we said, right? So if you have had the opportunity to be on the front line and bearing witness to people's lives and understanding kind of the nature and the context of the way that people have built lives and the way that politics and policy has either promoted, uh, you know, their, their way of being or inhibited their way of being, um, it, you would be uh, well served, right? To bring that to a larger landscape. Um, that being said, that's completely the ideal, right? And so how do you take, you know, um, that what you imagine to be the opportunity for physicians or any, um, you know, healthcare leader to be in that place and sort of take, you know, what they've seen and then put it into policy, like that is where we see, you know, a million levels of um, being stymied potentially. Um, and so, I would imagine, um, you know, and somebody I, I personally, you know, had this like a thought a lot about um, what, you know, what would you be giving up if you went into politics mm -hmm. in terms of a, you know, getting to take care of people where we, you know, uh, unlike the time of Warren, right. If you're, if you're in Congress, like you can't have a full medical practice. Um, uh, and then, and then also like, what are the ways in which we can still, um, uh, you know, have all these ideas of what we want to do or what we should be done and what can actually get done and how do we minimize um, the friction there. And I think there's, as we have seen, um, you know, politics has become very uh, ripe with opportunity for um, walls being built. And so if we can minimize those things and work together to do those things, obviously, um, I think probably more people would go into it. But that's, again, we could speak all night about it. And I'd love to hear from my colleagues. Yeah. Scott, what are your thoughts on uh, more doctors and, and government? I mean, I have to see like that. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think my political stripes have been sort of queer so far. And, and it's just be, I mean, so there are times where I've seen physicians in Congress um, again leverage their authority for, for views I vehemently disagree with. Now, this is, um, so it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, I'm not sure that doctors are inherently wiser than lawyers or others, um, you know, or, or more um, attuned to notions of equity, which, which I feel they should be highly attuned, seeing, you know, given that they take care of individual patients. Um, but that's my personal piece. Yeah. Um, let's see, whoops, I just saw someone was um, circling back to the medical dynasty question. It's striking that the Warren Boston medical dynasty was through Joseph's brother, John, and not through his own children. Do you think that's because they were left orphans after his death? Um, is it an example of the difficult decisions to balance family, career, and politics? Yeah, so, you know, I've often wondered, you know, with, with Warren so busy, how, how often could he have been around with his children growing up when he dies? He's got four children, the ages uh, between two and 10 years old, uh, two boys and two girls. Uh, his wife had died about a year and a half before that. He has an unofficial sort of fiance who is gets into a sort of nasty custody battle with her and the family. But uh, the issue was, is that both his sons die um, in their 20s and they're not married. They have no children of their own. So there's sort of no male heir to sort of pass this down to through the Joseph Warren line. And, and, and kind of incredibly, any, anything you've read in sort of the past 120 years or so has claimed that Warren's direct descendants died out about 100, 150 years ago. But again, there are about 30 of them. And they have an impressive military dynasty. So they kind of went the military way with, you know, West Point graduates and, and uh, Warren descendants serving in every American conflict from the Civil War to the present day. But, but I think that's why you see the John Warren line go, because 
John Warren's son, Dr. John, John Collins Warren, is again is a is a powerhouse in his own right. Okay, and and Dr. John Warren is one of the founders of Harvard Medical School, and so again, that's why you sort of see this sort of pass on through the John Warren line and not the Joseph Warren line. Um, so one of the other questions I wanted to ask everyone tonight is, um, in what ways does a doctor's activism inflect their relationship with patients? Um, and what does that look like on the ground? Are patients aware of when you're doing activist work at all or not? Pat, do you want to go first? Sure. I mean, I'll, I'll, I mean, I mean, I think, Catherine, you're, you're far more on the front lines in an activist sense than, than, than I am where I'm, I'm teaching it. But um, um, certainly, um, you know, again, if I were to invoke Paul Farmer, I mean, I don't think, I think every patient who knew what he was doing would be grateful that, that he's also in the room with them. I, I think the two can absolutely be coincided, especially if your activism is around, you know, equity and elevating the rights and the humanity of every person in front of you. Well, uh, I don't think any patient would appreciate that. That doesn't mean that, I mean, I, mean, I, I I've had my patients have mostly been my patients for somewhere between 10 and 20 years. They're probably pretty aware of my sensibilities at this point. And, you know, and I think if they're, you know, and I have patients across the political spectrum, we can have interesting discussions for sure. Um, and I think, you know, again, those who found them reprehensible to the point where they, they would have left a long time ago. Um, but, 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 I, but I feel the two really need, need to get in the way of one another. I mean, again, again if, if what you're being an activist about is, is um, elevating you know the agency and humanity of every whoever you can. You know, I, pretty pretty comfortable that most patients are going to be comfortable with that. Yeah, I would. I mean, I I would totally agree. I would say that you know within the context of the the patient care, um, I don't think that activism is kind of evoked as a a, a third person, right, or a third party. It really, um, you know, how do you again? It's like, can you have that? Um, caring relationship and the way that you take care of that person then inform your activism, which then could, you know, trickle back in a positive way, right? So it's really generative um, rather than kind of any, um, uh, you know, barrier. Um, and I totally agree with you, Scott. I think that, you know, I'm, I'm, I probably also have pretty clear stripes on my sleeve as well, mm -hmm. but, you know, but I work at Boston Medical Center and, mm -hmm. and again, you know, um, part of why I love working there is because I show up to work every day with people who share the same sensibilities. So it's an entire system, um, yeah. that is shaped that way. And, um, but I, I, I often don't think that, you know, patients aren't thinking about activism when they go see their doctor, yeah. right? They just want to feel better. <laughs> uh, and if you can like help them get um, free food and better housing and get rid of the mold in their carpet so their asthma is better, like awesome, you know, and that, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the work. Christian, do you, did you see, um, Warren's activism inflect any of the relationships with his patients, or is it sort of similar to what Catherine and Scott are saying? It's like the, the foundation of the relationship is about caring. And so you can do that regardless of where you sit on the spectrum. Yeah, I think Catherine really hit it on the head, right? When when your physician comes when you're sick, you're not you're not thinking about the political tussle that might be happening in the Boston Gazette at that time. You're, you're <laughs> focused on getting better or you're worried that you're gonna get good care. I mean. You know, but some of the things really do sort of mesh with other things. That, and then one thing I had to bring up was that, you know, we know that Washington is inoculating his troops during the siege of Boston. But one of the books that Warren's reading while this is all happening is Diseases Incident to Armies. So, again, it's 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 more of this activism on in a different, you know, there's sort of these concentric circles that 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 Warren was sort of having a foot in each one, whether it was military, social, economic, you know, his activism. So I, I, I you know, I, I couldn't agree with, with Scott and Catherine more with with what they said as far as, you know, that's not what's front and center when you are treating a patient. It, it might be a different conversation when you're in a tavern or something like that back then, but. <laughs> You know, at the time, really, I, you know, I really, I just couldn't agree with more than with what they said. Absolutely. Great. Um, so I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, access to medicine as a kind of justice, um, because I think that's also a theme that runs through Warren's life, as well as, you know, Catherine and Scott, your work. 
when we think about restoring access to medicine, um, how, do you see that as part of justice for people who are in oppressed or maligned communities? I'll go first. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I saw that, that uh, you know, we're not sitting next to each other. So yeah. <laughs> it's more challenging uh, to read, you know, the, the eye signals. But um, so I think the question around access, you know, obviously we know that, um, you know, traditionally oppressed communities have much less access to medical care. Um, again, systematically, uh, we, we live in Massachusetts where we've long had um, insurance, mass health, um, but even that obviously doesn't bridge the gap. I think, you know, but I want to ask the question of is access adequate, right? So like, can you actually open the floodgates, open the doors. We know that even it, when people have mass health, they still may not be accessing care. And so, you know, one of the things I'm deeply interested in, and I think it's the zeitgeist is, is now around this, is around medical trust. Like how do we actually go from access to trust, right? And, and how do we build that bridge um, towards not just making it accessible, but making it inviting, making it healing, making it important um, and a priority for people. Um, and one of the things that we're working on is, is actually creating restorative justice uh, circles where we are listening to patients and providers are able to listen and we're actually oh, bearing witness to each other's narratives um, so that we understand you know, we know historically in present day, there are a million reasons for medical distrust, but how do we actually move forward together? And so to me, that's where the real justice comes in, um, is going beyond access to, to actually creating something different together. Yeah, and certainly I, I keep invoking Paul Farmer because he's very much on, on my mind, but in certainly this this was, was, this was an absolute motivation, right? It, 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 it have people in, in the 2000s, when, when antiretrovirals for HIV were around, going to, you know, first to Haiti and saying, wow, it's as though they're dying of, of, of a treatable disease. Wait, it is a treatable disease. You know, and then really trying to think through the, you know, the, the systems and stuff and space and, and, and the structures that are necessary to, to bring medications to, and, 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 and systems in place to be able to administer those medications to people who need them. Um, and, and ironically, these systems that they're being developed in in Haiti and Peru were then brought back to Boston and being brought here. <laughs> I mean, I mean, which is unbelievable, but but certainly the, the, these the, these you know, inequities exist here as they do globally. Um, so then, then it's it, this is, you know once once it's framed as, as a fundamental right, um, and and um, you know any kind of discussions of, of scarcity and cost effectiveness, well, if that only applies to them and not to us. Then that's that that, that, that that's unfair. Um, and, and so, so that's just foregrounding um, basic rights uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, as your mission, and then designing the systems around them. Yeah. Um, so I feel like uh, Dr. Farmer is a, a theme in the conversation today, and he definitely is on my mind. Looking at another question from the chat, um, in our specialized world of today, could a character like Warren, with a foot in so many different camps, really be able to exist? Okay. Uh <laughs> <laughs> I would think so. Maybe not as successfully today as back then with, you know, social media and, and you know, <laughs> conspiracy theories. I'm, not that they weren't any back then, but uh, I think he might have a little bit of a rougher go of it today. But um, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's a great question, right? But yeah, so, you know, and not that he didn't experience any of that back then. I mean, there were plenty of people who just liked him and, and he lost plenty of patients and you know, certainly things like that. But again, I, uh, it, it really is. I mean, I think that's why he's such an amazing figure, right? Because he's somehow able to balance this. And because he's got a foot in all these concentric circles, and he's in all these different worlds, and he's treating everyone from the bottom rung of that social ladder to the top rung. And I, and I think that's one of the things that are endearing about him, right? He's not refusing medical care to anyone. You know, I'll say this, one of the things that really caught my eye was when they're talking about the smallpox ravaging Boston, anyone who had money went to their country homes, right? And it was sort of like during the COVID, we're all in this together, but yet the people who had money could go to their 
you know, cottage homes or work from home, but the people who couldn't are the ones delivering the groceries and working in the food yep. industry and delivering pizzas and, and making the food. So again, there is this dichotomy back then as there was today. And it, and it just amazes me how history does repeat itself. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and, I, and I will say that I think that people like Warren do exist. Um, right. And, and it's like, uh, but not everybody's writing their story or, or, you know, um, I think there are a lot of voices out there. I think to Christian's point, I think that social media has drowned out a lot of, um, voices and, and, um, but there are people who've just got their heads down who are doing really good work. And, um, and so I, I think that I like, you know, what Scott said about this trope, right? Like we're always like thinking the past is better, you know, in terms of treating the whole person and Warren, you know, had this like kind of amazing um, ability to do all things. Um, but I, but I, you know, I think one of the things I think about all the time as a medical educator is like, how do we train the next generation to be um comfortable in all those fears and recognize that they're all kind of interdependent and not have to be amazing at all of them, um, but kind of carry that spirit forward. Yeah. And, and caregiving isn't the exclusive domain of physicians either. I mean, you know, they're, right, whether other medical personnel like nurses or folks who are caring uh, for families, I mean, people live diverse lives and, and, and can uh, deliver care in, in many ways. Yeah. Um, okay, also from the chat, um, so living in Roxbury, right in the back of the Warren estate, I attend a lot of talks on Joseph Warren. I had heard at one of the talks I attended, if he had lived, he probably would have become the president. Do you also agree with that comment? So Christian, I'm assuming this one is more for you than, we won't ask Catherine and Scott to weigh in on that one, but if you have an opinion, you're warmly welcome. <laughs> Obviously, sure. I have my bias, you know, there's always biographers, that, hey, my guy's the best, and he would have done everything, and, uh, you know, I speculative history. I try not to dip a toe in that pond. I, I, I don't think he would have surpassed George Washington. I mean, I think Washington is going to become Washington. I always say I think it would have been incredible had Warren lived, how much easier he could have made that transition of power from Washington. Because again, Washington arrives, he's still a, a Southerner. So um, I don't think it's far-fetched to say that maybe he would have gone on to become governor like a Samuel Adams or a John Hancock or his political protege, William Eustace. But what I usually do say is I, I have no doubt that he would have been as active and effective in the post-revolutionary era as he was in the pre-revolutionary era. And I kind of leave it at that without uh, speculating into anything more. But yeah, I, I don't think he would have gone on to become first president. I mean, even though he was well known in the colonies, he writes the Suffolk Resolves, all the founders know who he is. I often refer to him as a founding grandfather because when he is doing all his political activism, you know, where are guys like Washington, Adams, Jefferson, you know, they're not on the scene at this point in this early, uh, late 1760s, early 1770s. It's really Warren and Samuel Adams. And it's always been my contention that if it wasn't for Warren's activism and him constantly pushing this needle and doing it all right, voice, pen and sword that, you know, maybe there wouldn't have been the shots fired at Lexington and Concord. And by that, maybe no Bunker Hill and maybe no Declaration of Independence. I mean, it's, it's great to sit here and speculate. We'll never know. But, you know, I think Warren definitely would have been active uh, in, in, in the new government, you know, with the founding fathers. But uh, first president, uh, that's, that's tough to call. So I'll leave that alone. So small, small bridge too far, perhaps. <laughs> Um, great. Um, so I feel like in, in a way this kind of touches on um, what, unless we get some other questions from the chat, will be our last question for the evening. Um, so we, when we think about Warren, we think of someone who's really passionate about freedom. Um, and we also know that as a nation, our concepts of freedom um, and freedom for who and freedom to what have really changed over time. So I'm curious to ask um, Catherine and Scott, from your standpoint, what role do you think health should play in our current contemporary understanding of what freedom means? So I'll, I'll, I'll just um, kind of uh, speak for, for a moment and um, really anxious to hear what Scott has to say. You know, I think a lot about um, freedom from and freedom to um, right. And, and so I really think about um, medicine and, and healthcare care um, and all of us who are involved in any way 
really working together to allow our patients and allow individuals to have freedom from, right? So um, freedom from, uh, you know, disease and poor housing and all of the kind of ways that chronic disease impacts lives, um, you know, and, and obviously we're not going to um, take a magic wand and take it away, but how do we kind of mitigate that so that people are free to live their lives, they're free to kind of pursue um, their greatest, their greatest calling, uh, whatever it may be, they're free to raise families, they're free to have pen and sword and, uh, uh, you know, everything else that Warren had. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I think a lot, I think you're right, Anne, I think this idea of freedom has changed a lot. Um, but at the fundamental basis, like we are still committed to creating freedom to um, uh, bigger, bigger things for, for other people. And I think healthcare has a huge role in that. And I think that was said perfectly. And I, I, I couldn't agree more, meaning, you know, we often frame this, let's say around quote unquote adherence to a medication regimen. We, we, we prescribe something, is our patient taking it or not? And how much responsibility do they have? How much, and it gets to the notions mm -hmm. of how much agency they have. Um, and so in, in, in this way, and again, I'm, I'm continually invoking Paul and this notion of structural violence and dismantling things that are inhibiting one's agency, uh, whether that be poverty, racism, whatever it may be, we can try to work at multiple levels to, to enhance the individual agency of our patients to um, do what they, they would like to do, to, full, you know, to live their, their, their fullest lives. Um, that's a, you know, a beautiful role we get to play as, as physicians or, or you know, folks who are uh, working more upstream. It's, it's just been a fabulous conversation. I've really enjoyed speaking with all of you um, for this wonderfully enlightening conversation. Um, so thank you so much for joining us and I hope we see you all back here soon. Thanks.